introduce our second speaker of the night. I'm going to grab his fun facts here. So our second speaker of the night is Kevin O'Rourke, and he was the previous senior manager of media and strategy at Target Canada. Um, but his three fun facts are that he once repelled on the side of City Hall in Toronto for 302 feet. That's pretty crazy. He is a Guinness record holder, and he's going to reveal the details of that at the start of his talk. And he was a former professional motocross racer. Very cool. Kevin, come yeah. on up here and share your yeah. talk. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, I first, I uh, guess I'll start by saying um, thank you to, to Marsha and the team. This is a really kind of um, refreshing kind of way to be able to talk about things as you're, as you're going through, obviously with, uh, with Target Canada, which obviously I'm no longer with, uh, that we'll talk about. So I'm going to share a little bit of the stories of my own personal failures and some of the, the stresses that uh, we had gone through. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Target Canada failures from my own opinion uh, from that side, so a little bit outside of what you would have seen in the media. Um, and uh, get through some of those items as well and talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of ways that uh, perhaps you and as part of the audience might be able to take some of the learnings from it. The biggest learning I sus uh, suspect that you'll find is that uh, even the big can fuck up. Um, so it's, we'll talk about that as it goes through so there's some elements that are in here that while it's at large scale, you can also fuck up at large scale. Uh, so it's very relative from that side. Um, I also would say that um, I think at the very start, Marsha had said, well, it's 10 slides, 10 minutes. Um, my first response was that's probably longer than Target was in Canada, so this should <laughs> not take too long um, from that side. And uh, I also wanted to maybe see if I can get one of the slides from Gita, that one with the, the stock shelf that's on there. That's a great shot. I don't know what that looks like. Um, so we're going to go through some of that. <laughs> And especially that AR app, is there a way to actually put product on the shelf? <laughs> and... So the first I'll tell a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, oh, the Guinness World Record. Um, I actually share it with 72,000 other people for the most amount of fake mustaches at a football game. <laughs> That's it. It's not as glamorous as you might have thought. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about my story. I grew up uh, in a very small town, speaking of fuck-ups. Uh, <laughs> Walkered in Ontario, uh, from that side, so southwestern Ontario, uh, and grew up just as kind of a farm kid. Um, got really invested, I guess, in autos uh, from that side. Uh, father had owned a John Deere dealership, so really got into small engines and did all those kinds of things. So that's kind of the redneck in me as it comes through. As we started to develop, you'll see as, you know, as part of my career, obviously I'm no longer with Target, I now work uh, for Palmorix, which is the weather network, uh, as their automotive lead. So throughout my uh, career, actually, I've uh, done a lot of automotive work, whether it's on the strategy side or the media side. And the, uh, the, the new, I guess, the derailment, <laughs> uh, as we started going here, I'll tell you a little bit uh, from that side. The first was just that kind of intrigue of, uh, as a headhunter had reached out to me, I was always in automotive. Uh, the person who was actually as the headhunter was also from the automotive industry and had come through. I will say that the, uh, the process uh, when I was first hired on, I should first ask, is there any corporate lawyers in the room <laughs> before I begin? Uh, is the process was, uh, came from Minneapolis as it started to, to run through the uh, headhunter um, process. Uh, nine interviews uh, all the way through, uh, most of which were in Minnesota, so it was kind of interesting to go down there. And every step of the way, there were some flags that I should have noted uh, from that side. So that's probably the first part of the fuck up part that I'll talk about from my own personal story is I was employee, I think around 36 uh, from that side at the head office. Um, and I was hired before my boss was hired. And then uh, I was hired bef uh, before everybody that was reporting to me. So I never had that chance to kind of uh, be part of the team, understand that team, ask the questions of a leader to find out if there's going to be uh, some, some pieces there. So if you're going through the process of uh, interviewing for jobs, first make sure they have uh, the person you're going to report to is already in play and that doesn't always happen. But um, I didn't ask enough of those questions. It was intriguing to me 
as I'm sure you can expect, is there's 125 stores being opened up in nine months. Uh, really exciting stuff as a marketer and certainly from a media strategy perspective. Uh, that in the automotive world, because I'd worked in many of the OEMs, uh, Mazda, Mitsubishi, et cetera, uh, that's a real long tail uh, when you're trying to affect someone to buy a car. It's usually uh, anywhere between three to six months. Uh, in a retail environment, I can influence somebody within seconds, and it was really interesting to me from that side. With the digital, the social, and some of the mobile that was starting to, to captivate at that time, it was a really exciting time in retail uh, to be able to come over. So as I was going through the process, it became more and more kind of intriguing uh, to me from that side. This was the first kind of kickoff uh, campaign that we had done for Target. So as we were going through, we had to do this. In, Target didn't open up all 125 stores at the same time. We did it um, in five different media waves across the country. So the first piece of, I guess, my own personal fuck up was more in the arrogance, perhaps, uh, of what we took from a, from a creative perspective is that you'll, you can see from this side, this is a lot of the out-of-home boards that we had had uh, through there. We also eventually had done a, um, an Oscar spot as we went through, but throughout that whole process, we tried probably way too hard with the Canadiana part of it. Uh, that, in hindsight, is really something you have to earn, uh, certainly from a Canadian perspective, is that you can't just force feed red and white, it happened to be the corporate colors, but you can see in this side that it's very overt uh, from a Canadiana standpoint. And we went very heavy on a fashion uh, perspective, which is still the target market for um, a target within Canada. But what we didn't realize is there's a, a couple of nuances that Canadians need out of a retailer that isn't necessarily addressed in this side. The other piece of the fuck up that I think we did is we opened up stores not in those waves, not close to each other. So we would open up uh, Guelph and then we'd open up Burnaby and then do things all the way across the country from that side. So it was very difficult from a media strategy perspective to try to find out what's the ways to let people know about a store that isn't there yet. Um, and I think what I would look at in hindsight is we did it so that very community-based. So we went out of home a lot just because it was in that side. We invested very heavily in Facebook uh, at the time. We actually, I think, I'm not sure if it's still a record or not, but we had the fastest growing Facebook fan page in Canada. Uh, we had a million followers in four months. Uh, as we went through. We paid for them very heavily uh, as we went through before the, uh, some of the Facebook pieces. And where that might, uh, again, in hindsight, a bit of a fuck up at that side, and part of it is because the technology didn't, didn't have it at the time, but it's also when you have a million followers who are your advocates, they also turn on you very quickly uh, on that side. So there was, it, it amplified itself uh, extremely high from that perspective. So this is what you would typically be uh, familiar with on that side, that the media kind of latched on the fact that there was no product, uh, there was um, you know, some missteps along the way. We like to call them fuck ups here, of course. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of ways that, from my point of view, some of the other things that went wrong that you probably didn't hear about uh, through the media or even with your own experiences. So hopefully can, I can share those with you as well. The first is um, what I'll call the red hangover. Uh, this is, you take over stores that look and feel very similar to the next store that's going to be coming into it. Um, part of that is just because of the color red, but if you remember, these are all Zeller's stores from before, uh, that legacy that uh, had come through. These stores represented a very quick and easy way for Target to expand into the country. Uh, they had 220 of these stores. We did leaseholds on 125 with, a, I think, another order for 50 uh, later on. But these stores were not in the same mold as Target had in the US. Um, these are stores that were typically not in the most desirable places for a retailer of this magnitude. Um, and it also represented something that is, Target in, in the US has mostly green grass builds. So they're one building, one entrance, one exit. They have a mantra of only two people in line or they'll open up another line. Well, in a mall situation, you've got five entrances and five exits. Uh, as the malls open. So there's no way to be able to measure that expectation that Canadians had. So we opened stores, and we heard about it very quickly. Um, we had a number of, uh, as I mentioned before, that kind of Facebook fandom turned, to, um, uh, turned on you very quickly, and they would make those comments from that, that perspective as well. And we had to start looking at 
what are those kind of misses that were on that side? And it really does come down to how do you manage the expectation that Canadians had that we messed up on from that side. The first is trying to be something that you, you could never be in the first place. Uh, I think in many respects, when we go to Target, I guess maybe I'll ask the question. People have been to Target, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Um, were you on vacation at the time? Right, you are probably there either a day trip or you were probably there as an overnight or you're there with friends and family. Your expectation of Target when you went to the United States is also very different than your everyday retailer from here. You would go there very slowly, walk around, browse, pick up stuff, look at it. You're on your own time, you're on a vacation time. So you're willing to forego possibly an empty shelf or the, the stock not being there or service that you didn't necessarily uh, live up to your expectation because you're on vacation, you're kind of tolerant. When you open up in Canada, you're now a retailer. Um, it's the everyday. You've got, excuse me for a moment. <clears throat> you might have uh, kids screaming. You might have dinner to get made. You have to get in, you have to get out. The cashier is not there. There's nothing on the shelf. Now you're pissed off because that experience is no longer just being a retailer that you just kind of browse and look for really unique items. You're now, in, it's an everyday. So that ex expectation that could have been done differently is that it was the best Canadian experience. We sold it as not target light. Still, that word shudders me <laughs> as we go through. Because we told Canadians this is not going to be target light. When in fact, that expectation could never be met in the first place. There are certain products that couldn't be carried in Canada regardless. Uh, part of it's bilingual packaging where you have suppliers in the US that offer really unique products and we ask them, hey, by the way, and you'd know certainly from a J&J &J perspective, it, you have to change all of your packaging for one market. And you can imagine that conversation. So you wouldn't have that product uh, being offered. Uh, same would hold true for uh, Archer Farms, which was their kind of private label piece. A lot of the ingredients wouldn't pass through so, some of those pieces coming into Canada. So those products wouldn't be carried. So already your expectation of what you would find in the US wasn't gonna be found here in Canada. Then stresses started to come in. We started having stores open, you saw some of the comments, uh, sales um, didn't perform. And this, after all, the reason they came to Canada in the first place is shareholder pressure. Uh, they were at their full expansion uh, still in the United States where there's nowhere else to really grow uh, other than trying to acquire uh, some pieces. They were looking at city targets and a couple of those pieces, but uh, ultimately the only way for shareholders to start making more money is to expand. And Canada offered a really good opportunity and with the Zeller's lease it was a real quick one. But those stresses started to come through because now shareholders are expecting massive returns as it comes through and we're bleeding uh, as we uh, start going through. We actually had a name for it in uh, Minneapolis called Canada Tired, that they were just exhausted with uh, and kind of washed their hands of it after a certain point. And that's about the time that things like the digital and social teams didn't come to Canada. E-commerce was killed uh, from that side. So they just, it started to snowball uh, a little bit from that side. So then they left. Um, this was a pretty dark day, certainly for many <laughs> Canadians as you go through. And I guess what, what people kind of forget a little bit about is the casualties that happens when a target leaves. One is your beloved brand is gone. Um, you've got close to 20,000 employees now out of work. But on top of that, you start looking at what are the other elements that were part of that uh, exposure. You've got creative agencies that were now no longer getting paid, that were on retainer. You have Starbucks locations, all, all of which also lost those employees. And pharmacists, which were brought in to the target side of things came on board right near the end and they had all like basically sold their prescriptions. That's kind of how that, that works through. So their business was bent on the fact that they would get great traffic from a target and then when that left, now their business is also gone. So it was a very tough time for the people that were kind of the unknown casualties. So on my side, um, for the first time in my career, I was unemployed without something else on the other side. I had always left the job for a job. This was the one where you would, um, didn't have anything on the, on the horizon from there. <clears throat> so it was a bit of a darker time 
for, for many of us from here. We were also told via email, which is kind of shitty, um, that the media kind of picked up on it in some cases before people even check their inbox uh, as we go through. So it was just a lot of uh, depression and a, and a bit of, quite frankly, it was just anger, I think, at that point uh, from that side. So I had to start looking uh, out from there. I also found that I had to hide a little bit, so kind of cut off from social media, would go to friends or family and not go to those. And it wasn't just because, you know, you fall into kind of a pit. It was more because the brand itself was so in, ingrained in Canadians that you felt responsible for it uh, in every, every sense of the word. Even though it's a massive organization, part of the reason I came to it is because it's kind of an entrepreneurial spirit with a Fortune 100 backing. So you would never believe that this was gonna happen uh, in the first place, but you ended up kind of hiding a little bit just because I wanted to avoid the conversation. The first conversation at dinner was, so what do you think happened? How come there's nothing on the, uh, you know, on and on and on. So it was really just a case of um, uh, hiding a little bit, kind of going into, um, you know, trying to find out how do I get out of this side of it. And it was a bit of a, uh, a virus that would follow you around. So as you're doing interviews, that same conversation would come up again. The interview changed from, you know, tell me about your skills, tell me about uh, what you can bring to it is, so what do you think happened with Target? Like, <laughs> as we started to go through. The glass half full, however, is you never had to explain why you left. <laughs> so, so it was never uh, from that perspective. So you dig in, and I would say that in Toronto specifically, um, the community, when you have such a large kind of layoff from that side or, or kind of a, a pushback uh, layoffs or, in this case, exit, um, that the community really did get together and others, including um, CPGs like J&J uh, &J and um, Procter and & Gamble and all, that would reach back out to everybody to say, is there any way we can help? So that, that kind of started to fuel a little bit where um, we got together collectively to try to help share uh, some of those things. Um, I took on, and if you're in this position, this worked really well uh, in my side. Uh, I ended up going back into automotive after the retail experiment. Um, not because I don't believe in retail, it's just I was just jaded. I may go back one day, I'm not sure. Uh, but it was really just, um, I booked coffee with everybody that was on LinkedIn that could help me, sat in a Starbucks, and I booked them scheduled every hour. So I had like 10 coffees through the day. <laughs> Completely buzzed by the last one. But it gave you a chance that Starbucks kind of became my office. And then I just had people come in and just tell me about, you know, what you're up to, how do we, um, how can I start to, look into different streams and, and then out of that, of course, then we moved on from there. So that is a lot of my story. Um, any questions? Yeah, I, th I think it really is one of those that you just you face the fear and go go at it. Like you, you would go at the dinner table and just make light of that whole situation. M no different than the way that I kicked off the whole piece is just talking about the empty shelves and making a kind of a joke of it. As it started to uh, move on from there, then I just found that the more I talked about it, then it just became less of an issue. Once that happened, that's when I was over that hump to say, um, I don't have to hide. I, now it's time to to start moving forward and, and uh, look for something else. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. 
Hey. Oh, good point. Um, yeah, because I didn't mention that. So the question was, uh, did I have a gut feel as we were kind of approaching the end? I, I assume that's kind of that piece. Uh, for sure. I mean, we, we started to sense that the mood in the, in the building did start to get a little bit toxic uh, near the end. But I will say, uh, without question, we had no idea that they were going to pull out completely. If we were to bet uh, everything we had, we assumed they're going to close 100 stores. Start at 25 and do it right from the other side. I mean, that's part of, you know, the reason perhaps of the fuck up is they went too big too fast uh, from that side. But it was also the fact that as we talked about from before, it's a destination kind of experience sometimes. So to have stores that you actually have to travel to, to get certain pieces is okay. It's an Ikea strategy. Like there isn't an Ikea in every city, but probably everybody here has shopped at an Ikea at some point. You go there with a $400 bag and you're gone. Uh, you don't do it frequent, and a retailer like this has to have frequency in order to, to build it through. So, yeah, there, was, there were some indicators as we started to go through. When e-commerce was killed, that was a big one for me because that was part of the reason I was hired on in the first place. And the digital and social teams stayed in the U.S. They never did come to Canada. So those were the two triggers for me. So it was less of a gut feel than kind of an indicator. Yeah, good point. Uh, how would you have liked them to have engaged with you? Is there something that they could, is there a way something you could talk about that wouldn't have been spent on there? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's more just y you, just be helpful is probably the, the Coles Notes version of it, as opposed to getting mired in that, uh, the reasons why, try to figure out how, do, how can I help go take you out of this, this place, or even is there anything I can do from a professional standpoint? Like just kind of change the narrative completely. I think all I wanted to have is just walk into a room and have no one talk about it at all. Like even if it was just in the back of their mind, that's fine. Uh, but just as it came up, then it just triggered me and just got me pissed off and then I'd leave. Um, so I think it's just more try to uh, change the narrative, but don't ignore it. Like there's still, it's not like an elephant in the room, but be cautious of the fact that that might trigger something. But I think it's just be helpful. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, the, from the media standpoint, we actually are, um, it was a difficult one because return on ad spend is typically always store traffic. And in my role for media strategy, we, our job was actually to try to get people excited about the potential opening in your neighborhood. So we actually didn't get much into that side of it because the stores hadn't really started to come to that. Um, I will say that, um, the, the Facebook one, would, we want to, wouldn't spend that much money on uh, moving forward, even in today's monetized world. Uh, the Oscar spot, however, uh, generated a massive amount of traffic for us um, from there. Uh, like return? Uh, I would say in that case, probably about negative eight. Yeah. Like it, in that, there's so much store traffic. I mean, the, the reason why big retailers have pharmacy and fresh grocery um, is because of frequency. Uh, in the Canadian marketplace, because we have such a huge geographic area and very few stores to, uh, um, to be able to accommodate it. Um, if you've got fresh grocery and pharmacy, that encourages Canadians to come three times a week. If you don't get Canadians coming three times a week to a large retailer, they will be in trouble. Yeah, I think we've got time for one, one more. Uh, go ahead. Was there any wacky knee-jerk reaction media ideas that you had while things were going down? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we had a lot. Um, I, I will say that, yeah, they did a really good job of experiential ahead of time. I don't know if you uh, people had gone to the pop-up store before we were announced. Um, we wrapped the ferry going to the Toronto Island and paid for everybody on that side. So the experiential was really good. Uh, I will say there's two ad ideas that we turned down. Um, and it was all, all part of that original shoot for the Oscars. We originally had uh, someone flying over top of Calgary, dropping target parachutes with parachuters <laughs> and dropping it right where the store location would have been. Um, and it got pulled, we had, everything was bought, uh, shoot was there and we um, got out of it because the fear was that Canadians would think that we were invading. <laughs> 
<laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>